Egypt and more about Moses. The second half is now about the giving of the law and the construction of the tabernacle, which has a lot of you know, symbolism in it. Um, and, and I really appreciate what Tim Keller was saying about Exodus, how God didn't say to the people, I'm going to give you the law, and if you follow it, then I'll get you out of Egypt. It was by grace. He got them out of Egypt. And then, through many trials and tribulations, and, you know, and today we're going to be talking more about the giving of the law. And the law, of course, we've talked about in one of the tenets of Protestant you know, theology is we can't keep the law. We can't do it on our own. It's to show us the holiness of God. It's to show us that we need a Savior. And then we talked about Mount Sinai. We saw a video that showed where they thought Mount Sinai might be. And it's got kind of a black top, which is interesting. All the, uh, the people in the area, they call it you know, like Moses Mountain and things like that. They, we saw the thing about the split rock. I mean, it, it's a very unique structure. And, and then, you know, others went to Mount Sinai too. I don't think we talked about that last week. But Elijah, when he was running away, when he was all discouraged, he went to Mount Sinai, got in a cave, and God spoke to him there. It, a lot of people believe that when Paul went to the wilderness of Sinai, when he was getting taught by God directly, that he probably went by the mountain as well. So Mount Sinai is in Saudi Arabia, and that makes it difficult for people to go there and make expeditions there. I'm sure if it was wide open, there'd be tours all the time. <laughs> um, he gave the eagle analogy in the scripture here. And it's mainly, you know, that God watches over his people like a protective parent eagle. You know, Jesus gave a bird analogy too. He says, oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, if only you had, you know, beckoned to me, I would have, you know, would have been like a mother hen covering her chicks. You know, another vivid imagery of how God watches over us. Chapter 19, verse 5, in the King James, it says, Peculiar people, and, you know, and all of you know that you've probably been told you're very peculiar. <laughs> Your teenagers probably told you that. Um, <laughs> but this it, peculiar in the old English, that meant something different than today. That meant more like chosen or set apart. And that's what God did in you know, the Ray Vanderlyn series that always talks about that. Why did God you know, start with Abraham and set these people apart? It was to bless all the nations. It wasn't just so they would be the object of God's blessing, but they would be a channel of God's blessing to the whole world. And of course, that did happen for sure with Christ when he came, a uh, blessing to the whole world. And then we're a kingdom of priests. The New Testament, Peter and Paul tell us the same type of thing. You know, you are a chosen generation or a peculiar people. You are a kingdom of priests. And that's one of the main tenets of Protestants versus Catholic, is that the priesthood of the believer. We don't have to go through an intermediary to reach Christ. We don't have to pray to Mary or other saints to get you know, with God and get forgiveness. Now, um, you know, some people would say um, that there is something therapeutic, though, that the Catholics have when they go to someone and confess their sins. I don't think the priest has, you know, the authority to say your sins are forgiven, unless he's saying that, you know, God has forgiven. I don't know, I've never been to a confessional, but I remember a little neighbors, the Catholic family across the alley from us growing up, you know, he, they would go to confession every, every week. I don't know. Maybe, I don't know if it was every day. I don't think it was every day. But I remember the little guy that was about a couple years younger than me. He would tell me 
a dirty joke, and then he would say, before that he'd tell it, he'd say, no, this one doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> so he didn't have to confess that one when he went oh. to the police. Because <laughs> they didn't count. <laughs> um, <clears throat> now, we saw a little video clip of Moses coming down from the mountain originally. And and all the people are saying, yeah, yeah, we're going to do it. And Moses is saying, no, no, you can't do it. And that was the same thing with Joshua in his farewell address. We talked about how <laughs> the people are saying, yeah, we'll follow the Lord. And he says, no, you're probably not. You know, you can't do it by yourself. You need something more. Why? Why? <laughs> We can't do it by ourselves? No. Why did the people always go back into sin? Even my my niece, when she was about five years old, well, I'd give her her children's Bible, and she figured out how come they sin and then go to God and then sin again and go to God. They yeah. keep sinning. Why don't they behave themselves? Well, <laughs> I mean, there is grace, but there's not. Slippery grace, greasy grace. Yeah, right. And Paul, Paul talks about that too. You know, what you know, those that say we shall, you know, sin so that grace can abound. He says, no, 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 no. That's not real. <laughs> but a five-year-old can figure it out. But a five-year-old figured it out. They're pretty perceptive. <laughs> so, so the law doesn't make us holy, but the law is our tutor to lead us to Christ. And of course, all the symbolism of the, all the law, all the tabernacle points to Christ. And we've been going through, <laughs> Tim Keller's doing that series on every book of the Bible pointing to the gospel. And he was saying about the Leviticus one, he says, he says, he says I know a lot of people, when they read the Bible through, they skip Leviticus. <laughs> Um, but he says it, it really is important because it does teach us about God with, with all the, the, you know, the tabernacle is, is showing kind of like the Garden of Eden. It was a place that God is to meet with us. So that's what we did last week. So we have a little bookmark for you. I don't know. Oh, you guys don't get the bookmark. I'll leave you out. Even though you came with it, I'll give you one. They didn't get a kit. What was that? They didn't get a kit. Oh, well. We have to see the master yeah, about yeah. that. Oh, yeah. Oh, he could get one. We were great with the camera. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so today we're going to finish up. Yeah. One thing I just wanted to say about that the uh, water coming out of the rock. Yeah. At least two places in the scripture it says it flows out of flint, the mountain of rock of flint. Flint isn't everywhere, so that should have been a help, help to have a locator. Oh, well. okay. Yeah. The mountain one that was split. Yeah. And, and flint is not a porous rock. It's not like you hit an aquifer. <laughs> but it is soft, because it won't spark. That's what they got players in. Yeah. But it's not sandstone. No. Yeah, right. No, it's a hard <laughs> okay. So, verses 9 through 11, chapter 19. The Lord said to Moses, I am going to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear me speaking with you and... <clears throat> will always put their trust in you. Then Moses said to the Lord, what the people has said. <clears throat> and where do I go? Okay, verse 11, did you finish? 11? Yeah. And the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day because on that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai and 
in the sight of all the people. Okay. Now, we like to portray often, you know, the giving of the laws as a beautiful, peaceful thing. It was actually a pretty scary, I think, event, and pretty awesome, you know, I mean, the glory of God coming down on top of the mountain. And, and Moses is saying, listen, he says, we're going to set up, you know, the yellow, do not cross line, you know, that there was forensic case there. Don't cross it, because if you do, you're gone. If any animal crosses, and, and you know, and set yourself apart, get ready. And verses 12 through 16, you'll notice all the people trembled. <coughs> Today's world doesn't really have a healthy fear of God. No. <coughs> But God is not mocked. And God is mocked today. We're in trouble. And, and even probably in a lot of the churches, there's not a healthy fear of God. You know, it almost, you know, it's like a trite thing almost. Um, you know, I, I said there was a song that youth group sang, you know, I love Jesus better than ice cream. Well, <laughs> that's pretty trite. Um, when we were attending meetings for our business and stuff, and uh, we had somebody, the Joys had Sunday morning worship services, and one of the guys was saying, when he, that he had run into, there was, Particularly when you talk about one businessman, but it happened more than once. One businessman said, I cannot follow the way, I can't follow God, I cannot do it because I can't run my business the way I want to run my business. And I can't do it. <coughs> Which in a sense, he was actually turning his back on the Lord like that. He didn't last very long, he died. Yeah, people don't realize either the consequences of, of not works. having the, the, yeah, right? And it's not just the Old Testament. I mean, you think of Ananias and Sapphira, who kind of mocked God, thinking God didn't really care that they lied. Yeah. yeah. So, so we saw that video where it does show the black and top of the mountain. It's probably, it's probably the real place there. Um, and we talked about, I mentioned Elijah and Paul. It was in 1 Kings 19, Elijah traveled to Sinai. And, uh, and he, he was kind of overcome with the awesomeness of God as well. Um, Paul certainly had a, a real fear of the Lord. I mean, he had the vision of Christ on the road to Damascus. You know how? You know that would be that would be pretty scary too. And then get blind. It's kind of interesting that if he went to Mount Sinai, where the law was given, that's where he received grace, where Jesus taught him to talk grace. Right. Yeah. So that was. Because yeah. <coughs> Paul probably already knew the Old Testament, the Torah, inside and out. He probably, you know, I think, you know, being discipled by Gamaliel, I think their deal was, you know, you basically, you memorize the whole Bible, you know. So, um, so verses 19 through 22 through 25, so Moses came down, and that's where we had that little conversation with the people. And he says, you know, set apart yourself, you know, wash yourself, you know. This is a big deal. This isn't, you know, the carnival. Although, as we'll find out, Aaron turned it into kind of a carnival. So before they even got the Ten Commandments, as we're going to see, they broke it. <laughs> so let's turn to chapter 20 now. Let's read, somebody read chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. And God spoke all these words, 
I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You Okay, yeah. Is that is that through verse two? Yep. Okay. So once again, and you know, he's giving a reminder again about deliverance from Egypt. And that's an ongoing theme, you know, throughout the whole Old Testament. Don't forget, you know, in Gideon, you know, the prophet came and he reminded them again of, of all of the things God had done for them. And, and Gideon's thinking, you know, where is this God? <laughs> so, now no one can play fast and loose with God's laws. It does remind us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The covenant of grace doesn't disrespect the law. Now someone read Romans 6, 1 and 2. So the covenant of grace doesn't say do whatever you want to and God's going to forgive you no matter what. I mean, he does, but I was listening to a Colin Smith sermon this morning. He was saying how the Beatitudes, you're not saved by living the Beatitudes either. You're saved by Christ dying on the cross. Now, the Beatitudes, your character should follow that, but it's not because you follow the Beatitudes you're saved. It's you start following the Beatitudes because you are saved. Um, now, those that are going to live by the law for salvation will never succeed in doing it. And, you know, Martin Luther had that aha moment where he's reading and it says the just shall live by faith and all of a sudden you know it just kind of came to him you know like yeah what are we doing here <laughs> here and he's seeing the guy you know selling indulgences you know so that you know if you have an uncle harry that died well you know if you give so much of the church to help build you know the sistine chapel or whatever you know, then, you know, he's going to have, he's in purgatory right now, but you can get him out early. Bail him out. Bail him out, that's right. <laughs> and I, in Sunday school, I read that from my Catholic friend about his wife that had died. And he said, yeah, she did so many wonderful things. He says, I hope it was enough. And there's no mention of purgatory. No, 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 that's... Uh, I don't know if they actually teach that anymore or not, if that's, that was a big deal for a while, so that they could sell the indulgences and make some they extra money. Okay, yeah, okay. And of course the Apocrypha is, it is in the Catholic Bible. I can say it was scripture. Yeah. So the law is a mirror, too, to show us that we do need a Savior. We look in the law and we say, well, I can never do that. That's right. You can't. Just like Moses said and Joshua said, you can't do it. And it doesn't make you a sinner. It reveals that you are a sinner. <clears throat> J. Vernon McGee gave this story of a man jumping off the Empire State Building because he didn't believe in the law of gravity. As he passed an observation deck, on the 50th floor, a bystander asked him as he was going down, uh, so how is it going? And he replied, well, so far, so good. That's how you stop it, yeah. So, and, you know, people do, you know, they think, 
I can I can break all these laws. It won't make any difference because I don't believe in God anyways. We're going to get to that about atheism in a little bit. Uh, Ezekiel 18 says, "The man that sins, he shall die." That's one of the promises we don't say. Every promise in the book is mine. <laughs> <laughs> and and we're born with a sinful nature to <coughs> That's a lie that our culture says that kids are born with a blank slate and that their environment makes them good or bad. Now, the environment does contribute to certain behaviors and things like that, but any, but you know that uh, kids, even at a young age, they they have a sinful nature. We all. Have had kids know that. <laughs> What's the first word a lot of uh, two-year-olds will say? No. no. Yeah. <laughs> when they hear the most. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. That's true. They're mimicking there. So, yeah, this blank slate idea too really makes it <clears throat> so that you don't need a savior as well. But David said, "In sin did my mother conceive me." And, and we always need to remind, remind us of that. Well, the Ten Commandments. So Moses is going to give the Ten Commandments. Go get them. We're going to see a little clip here in a second. But there's two parts, as we know, to the Ten Commandments. The relationship to God, and then the relationship to others. And we know this passage, but why don't we look it up, Matthew 22. 37 through 39. And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So the man came to him and asked Jesus, you know, what is the greatest? And Jesus gave that request. And, and so that guy was, you know, he accepted that. He understood that. And was that the time, too, when he said, who is my neighbor? I forget. That's for the prequel to uh, the Good Samaritan story. But the interesting thing, which I didn't realize, is that there's different versions of the Ten Commandments that the Catholics have a different one than what we're familiar with. We didn't realize that. And this man that I was reading, he said, so when the Ten Commandments were up down in Alabama, he said probably most Catholics would be kind of surprised that it's different than theirs. So he said, if you are going to post the Ten Commandments, you know, it's kind of like, which Ten Commandments are you going to post? And one of the differences is, Instead of honor the Sabbath and keep it holy, it, the Catholic version says honor the Lord's day and keep it holy. So Sunday, which we do. I mean, we don't, none of us here are Seventh-day Adventists that I know of anyways. <laughs> but of course, Seventh-day Adventists are pretty strong on that. My, uh, my daughter in Colorado had a Nicaraguan immigrant stay with them for a while. And he was a really a true asylum seeker. His, his dad had been a general in the 80s against uh, in the Sandinistas. And so he was on the blacklist there, and, and that spilled over to him. They were raiding his home and wrecking it and things like that. He, had, he eventually went back to Nicaragua because he uh, was missing his, uh, his family, which he'd left behind. But he was a, a, a very Jewish or a believer. He was not Jewish, obviously, but he believed in keeping the law. And so he was very judgmental of Don and her family going to not going to church on Saturday, but going to church on Sunday. And I don't think he would go on Sunday because that wasn't you know what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to keep the, the Sabbath, you know. He had a bunch of ideas like that. Certain 
dietary things and um, so that was that was interesting her her brother-in-law is now there from Nicaragua and he's got some interesting ideas too there's a Spanish service in their church and he was going to go to that but the person that greeted him had piercings and tattoos and that was just like I'm out of here you know this uh, so it's interesting but uh, you know different cultures and uh, and he he also believed that uh, the Lord of the Rings was satanic so so a guy would be upset with that one right? <laughs> and I and I would be too so they were trying to explain to him you know that the man who wrote it was a believer and anyways I'm off track here a little bit okay <laughs> So, so we're going to watch a little clip from probably the most well-known <coughs> video. And this one probably is I don't have uh, copyrighted, so there's going to be a blank for those people that own it. Okay, let's see if I can get it up. I don't know what was wrong on Sunday that my uh, little connection hit. <coughs> Okay, let's see if we get it all here. Just like your belly button <coughs> is, gives a pretty interesting representation of putting the out the rock. Got <laughs> I mean, how can you do it? I mean, really. I mean, how can you portray that? It says by the finger of God, but. We mentioned that how the Ten Commandments was probably not real big because it did fit in the Ark. So, like we said, it was probably a, a small font, a small Helvetica. Okay, so, so verse, verse 3, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And it, it was interesting how they portrayed that. You know, thou should not make any graven image. And then they, they did a shot down to what's going on down in the valley, you know. And of course, the people have been telling Aaron, hey, Aaron, you know, where is this Moses guy? Where is your brother? You know, we haven't seen him for a while. You know, and we want to go back. And, and of course, the bull, having the bull there was, that was the main, one of the main gods in Egypt. Now, I don't know if it was quite that elaborate the way it was, you know, the bowl. That, that seems like pretty fine work there. Of course, Aaron said, remember, what did he say? Can't remember. Did, yeah. Oh, he said, when Moses asked him, what are you doing? <laughs> and, and Aaron says, well, you know, the people who are, you know what they're like. <laughs> and he said, you know, they gave me the gold. I put it in. I melted it. I poured it out. And you know, I'll clean this bowl. <laughs> That's a, cl a clear case of uh, passing the blame. Yep. <laughs> just like just like Adam did. Not my fault. Not my fault. I mean, this woman that you gave me. <laughs> um, now it's a clear reference to the common polytheism that was rampant in the culture everywhere. All of the surrounding cultures had many gods. They had gods that were localized too. I remember in one of the stories, in, in, I don't know if it was in Kings or where, you know, they got defeated and, you know, the king said, this other country says, well, you know, that's because they have a god that's the hill god, you know. If we attack them in the valley or something like that, it's not going to go good for us. Well, you know, it's interesting. Even Abraham came from a culture of polytheism in Ur. That's, I think, pretty significant. There's a, in Joshua 24.2, it, it tells us that. I might, I might show this little clip later. It's, uh, it's an, rabbinical stories say that Mo 
uh, Abraham worked in the idol shop in his father's store. They made idols. A guy comes in and he says, what do you got? He says, well, he says, how about this one here? He says, why do you want that? He says, it was a chunk of wood this morning. <laughs> why do you want to pray to that? You know, so they portray Abraham as having, you know, kind of rejecting the idol worshiping even before he had really been called by God. Um, and it, Joshua 24, 2, why don't we read that? Because that's... Joshua said to all the people, this is what the Lord, the, the God of Israel says, long ago your forefathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and Nahor, lived beyond the river and worshipped other gods. Yeah. So he's saying, you know, you have a, a culture that's affected you, and, and even then, when he's given that farewell address, he's telling them, you know what, Go get rid of all your idols. Now this is this is 25 years after the conquering of the land. They still have idols in their tents, and they say, "Okay." And and then the key verse two later is it said the people followed the Lord as long as you know Joshua lived and all the elders that had seen the miracles were alive. After they died they went and started serving idols again. And the, the idol of choice in that whole culture was Baal and Asherah. And they were the gods of fertility, and so they would offer sacrifice to make sure they had good crops, things like that. Did it work? Well, you know, they, it should have been an eye-opener because in the time of Gideon, they were worshiping Baal, but they didn't get their crops because the Midianites would come and steal all their crops and their cattle all the time. They should have figured out, you know what? This isn't working. <laughs> and then the, the famous story too is when God called Gideon, he tore down the Baal idol and the Asherah pole and he burned them. And when the people found out it was Gideon and they went to his dad and they said, hey, you know, Gideon's gotta die. <laughs> And, and I, I thought it's so cool, you know, the dad says, even though the dad probably was a Baal worshiper too, he says, hey listen, he says, if Baal's really that all powerful, let him deal with it. You know, if he's offended, let him deal with it. You don't have to. <coughs> I was thinking about, like, they would worship Buddha, and they bow down and do all these things, and there's others that that have those kind of things going on here. Like, what have they done for you that you would recognize that they did something for you? Right. Yeah. So, and for yeah. them to kill you. Yeah. I think Buddhism, it's a kind of complicated. I think Buddhism says there really isn't a god, per se. Hindus have thousands, but right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They don't do anything. <coughs> yeah. And they pray. So, because people reject God because, they, because their deeds are evil too. They don't want to be acknowledge a God that has a law that says you shall not. Um, you know, atheists have been around for a long time too. Because, you know, David said in the Psalms, he says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. That's what, uh, that's the old joke, you know, April Fool's Day is atheist day. <laughs> I heard some, some place that said atheists really do believe God, that there's a God. Because if they, if they wouldn't have to keep going, saying, trying to go against that there's no right. God. <laughs> If yeah, why if spend so much like time? Why there. spend so much time trying to disprove him? Yeah, they have obviously believe there is one. Yeah. Well, one of the more famous atheists today, of course, is Richard Dawkins. And I played this clip in Sunday school of, of Ben Stein interviewing him. And it says, 
Richard Dawkins is not pleased with God. He says, the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character of all fiction, jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving, control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser, a homophobic, racist, infanticidal, geocidal, uh, philistial, pestitidal, megalomania. Well, no need to finish the quotation. <laughs> you get the idea. Dawkins seems to have chosen God as his sworn enemy. Let's hope, for Dawkins' sake, that God doesn't return the compliment. And I just think it's so sad. Like you say, you know, he spends so much time dealing with God, and he thinks he's helping people that want to be atheists. Um, they both, both he and the co-author, both appear to think it requires considerable courage to attack religion these days. I risk a fist to the face, or worse, yet I persist. I don't think that's true anymore. Do you? I think people are saying, well, that's fine. And, you know, just the decline of the increase in people that are non-believers in anything. They don't make this, they're maybe agnostic more than atheist. Um, so, so Dawkins, of course, is one. Um, you know, Romans 1, 21 through 25, we should read that. This is why people want idols. I just found some scripture in Psalm 115. It says, their idols are... Silver and gold, the work of human hands, they have mouths but do not speak, they have eyes but do not see, they have ears but do not hear, noses but do not smell, they have hands but do not feel, they have feet that do not walk, they do not make a sound in their throat. Those who make them become like them, so do all who trust in them. Wow. Yeah. And then Isaiah talks about that too, you know, that, that here they make they, here they take one pile of wood, they make an idol, and the other pile of wood, they burn their supper down here for heat and warmth. Um, Romans 1, 21 through 25. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became puta in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. And exchange the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and the birds, four footed animals, and crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them over in the lusts of their heart to impurity, that their bodies might be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. And I had read an article in Anarchy of Worship, but it brought up that verse and says, you worship Satan when you exchange the truth of who God is for a lie. Yeah. Yeah, so when you worship the created, so you're worshiping the lizard, the, the bird, you know, the Aztecs of that, uh, that bird that they worshiped, etc. So people want it because they've rejected God. Um, now, verses 4 through 5 is kind of the second part of or number 2. Somebody read 24 and 5. Are we back in Exodus then? Exodus. Yeah, Exodus 20. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. It'd be pretty hard to find Romans 20, I guess. <laughs> You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of any thing that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation and to those who hate me. I have heard that some of these idols, they will have a place drilled out underneath 
to have an opening, a hollow inside of that idol. And people say that an evil spirit will go in and dwell inside that, that idol and they've created a space for it. That's why it's, it's very dangerous, they say, let's say you wanted a souvenir from Africa and you bring that into your house, that that can be very detrimental. And I, I've heard of situations where you know things just went out of control and they got rid of the, that idol and things improved. So sometimes, you know, these idols do have things behind them, and I think the scripture teaches that, that there are demons behind these idols to make them, and that's one reason they have a strong hold on people as well. There's a spiritual part of it. Even though it doesn't make sense mentally, logically, that this is something that's, you know, good, like it, there are demonic forces behind it. And I think, you know, like Baal, too, is the same thing. Now, many people will read this today and they say, well, you know, in America, we're too sophisticated to have idols and graven images. Well, J. Vernon McGee talks about, uh, we do have idols without the name. Perhaps Bacchus, the god of wine, you know, alcoholic companies have big business. I mean, they're the ones that can really afford, you know, commercials on Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> they have, you know, they're, they're huge businesses. Remember during the lockdown, Wall said, well, we won't close down the liquor stores because they're essential business. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I can somewhat understand that that would cause you know, chaos. <laughs> but they'll, they'll fill up the emergency rooms. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, yes, the ratio of bars to churches in a small town. But the bars. Small town America, the three, three or four bars down the street, maybe one church. Yeah. If you're lucky. Yeah. Well, when you go up to the Iron Range, you know all these individual small towns. You go to their old downtown, every other storefront was a liquor store or a bar. And I, I, I always thought, why did they have so many bars? It's because they were ethnic. Okay, that's the Finnish bar there. You don't want to go there. There's the Norwegian bar. You sure don't want to go there. Ryan, so does this mean that no matter homes, any objects that could be considered demonic? Absolutely. Need to be God. I, like, yeah, I, if God leads you to do that, if that's something that came from, that was had association with an idol, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I would play it safe. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, yeah. Kim. Years ago, we had a Bible study going on, and we were meeting at Ellen and Jane Sexton. We would move the study around, but they had gotten a dog from somebody, and its name was Lucifer. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that dog was wreaking havoc in their house. I mean, it was just a runaway. And I was talking with Al about it, and we had a Bible study. I said, you know, you need to pray in the name of Jesus and command the Spirit that are with that dog to leave and change his name. And they did. You know what? Everything stopped. Wow. Everything stopped yeah. as soon as they did that. Yeah. We forget that we're in a spiritual battle. That's right. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Another uh, idol that from Greek and Roman times was Aphrodite. And she was the goddess of sex. And we saw this in the Ray Vanderlyn series when he went to Corinth. And, um, and you know, and of course today, I mean, the sex business is big time business. Uh, the Super Bowl, one of the things, remember, when it came to Minnesota, they were trying to, they were worried about it because of all the prostitution organized crime rings that were operating when the Super Bowl comes, which is very sad. Um, now, some, one thing that's been controversial over the years is statues like, uh, 
in a, a Mary, etc. in Catholic churches. Um, the Eastern Orthodox, they tend not to have statues, but they tend to have pictures. And some of that goes back to this commandment, the, the Eastern Orthodox. But what I, what I read was, now we can see that when the commandment is not referring to the act of carving, it's not the act of carving statues, but the act of carving them and then worshiping them in the place of God. Given that Exodus 20 verse 5 comes right in the middle of verses about worshiping God, it makes sense to interpret it as a prohibition against worshiping images rather than making them. Therefore, the commandment prohibits not the statues, but the idols, the worshiping of them. Now, you could argue that people worship Mary. I've never, I haven't been Catholic, but there's, there's some element of that where she's set up maybe on too high of a pedestal, equal with, with God. Um, so people that believe in icons argue that God was invisible and infinite and therefore beyond human ability to depict in images. Of course, we have the famous Michelangelo one of the big bearded God reaching down, you know, the famous one with this finger touching Adam. Unfortunately, I think that's the image that a lot of non-believers have of God. He's a great big grandfather up in the sky, you know. I mean, you think of Mormons, and Mormons think that God is a man, a deified man, you know, that he pulled himself up by his own bootstraps, and uh, he's up there, he's up there with his thousand of wives and populating the world down here. This is his world, and it's, once you get into what Mormons really believe, Mormons are great people. And I was talking to Steve about that, how, you know, when you, when you taught school, if you had Mormon kids in the classroom, they were really well behaved. Not always the evangelical kids. <laughs> but, uh, so, so there is that whole, the icon people agree that God could not be represented in images, but argue that when Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was born as a human being with a physical body, allowing himself to be seen and depicted, since some icons were believed to date to the time of Christ, icons were understood to offer kind of proof that the Son of God entered the world as a human being, died on the cross, rose from the dead, and ascended into heaven, all for the salvation of humankind. So, so when we watch the Jesus movie and things like that, that's not prohibited by scriptures because of making a, an image. But, of course, as we've been seeing in Sunday school, there's a lot of different views of what Jesus maybe looked like. The only view we have from scripture of what Jesus looked like was from Isaiah. And it said he had no form or comeliness that we should be holding. In other words, he wasn't good looking. <laughs> he was a beautiful person. Yeah, but he had a beautiful personality and people were drawn to him. Yeah. <laughs> it's not so much about the, the actual images or pretty things and idols and the house and things like that, but talking about no, no other gods before me, but there's people who make gods out of work. Right. Oh, make okay. a god out of the church. Right. Yeah. Um, How did become a god? Yeah, anything can become what you worship, what you place in front of God. Right. I'm going to close real quick about the story of Gideon. So after Gideon won, Gideon wouldn't have intentionally created an idol. He had torn down the Canaanite idols. But the precious golden garment he created in, in, uh, in Judges 6. So he asked for all this gold, but what he created was an abomination. It appears to substitute an ephod reserved for the high priest's use only. 
and may have set Gideon up as a seer to determine God's will for Israel instead of the high priest. And even if Gideon didn't worship the ephod, certainly many worshipped it as such. The ephod and Oprah became a source of sin. So it's interesting, a lot of guys in the Bible start well, they didn't end well. And Gideon was certainly one that, because there was a trap, it became a snare to the people. He didn't intend it to be an idol, but the people took it as an idol. And that's why we've talked about why Michael the archangel hid the body of Moses from Satan. Because if everybody knew where Moses was buried, you can bet there would be a place that people would have worshipped that place. And there certainly would have been some church in Israel that would have a church over the supposed spot where Moses was buried. So, and next week we'll talk about Hezekiah, and, and last week we talked about uh, the, uh, the fiery serpent on the pole, and later that became an idol. So even things that start out good can become idols in our lives. And so Nehemiah, or I'm sorry, Hezekiah, ended up getting rid of it. So we'll close with that today and get to my videos, but that's okay, we'll save them.